Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church, if I have not met you yet. Um, and we have been in a series called The Church, The Hope of the World. And we, this series is looking through several different metaphors that are used in the New Testament to describe what the church is, what it, its purpose was, and what Jesus desires for us to do. And so today's topic, we're going to be talking about the body of Christ. And so... One of Jesus' more famous statements that he made during his time here on earth was from John 13, 34 through 35. It'll be up on the screen for you. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I think if we were to take a silent poll of people in our church and probably even Christians amongst uh, America or even across the world and ask people, how, do, how are we doing at this? How is the church doing at loving one another? I think the majority of people would probably mark something along the lines of that we're not doing this very well. And I think that's one of those things that's hard for us to swallow. It's hard for us to hear that because we want to believe that we are loving each other well, and there are places that are doing this very well, but there are places that really are not. And, and Christians, on the whole, are known for a myriad of other things except for loving one another. And so why is that? Why do we struggle at doing this? Why do we have such a hard time doing it? I think there's a, f a few reasons why we do this. First of all, I think we tend to be more focused in our human nature, tend to be more focused upon ourselves, more focused upon what we like and what we want to do, rather than being focused on who Jesus is and what he has done and letting his life flow through us. We get focused on everything else. We get focused on things that truly they are important, but they are not more important than Jesus. Secondly, I think some of the things that we do, one, another thing we do is we seek to be right. Okay, I think sometimes we want to like get ourselves onto the hill and this is a hill that we're going to die on. This is something we're going to be really, this is really important. We're going to be right instead of seeking to have unity or to continue in friendships and sometimes just to let someone think that they're right. We have, we have this really strong tendency to say we must be right. And I think lastly, we, like, we tend to divide ourselves into tribes. And what I mean by that is we divide ourselves into these group of people that we're comfortable with, that we know, that are similar to us, that have similar ideas, similar mindsets, and we don't branch ourselves out. And so anybody that's not inside that little little tribe that we know, it, we're uncomfortable with them, we don't understand them, and sometimes we don't even like them. And truly, as a youth pastor, that just sounds straight up like high school. Like, if you think about high, the way high school is, high school was so much like this place where it's like, you have all these different cliques. I remember even being in the lunchroom, and I had a, I, I'll be honest, I was part of a Christian clique. There was like 20 of us uh, in, in this one clique, and we had other people who would come in, and we were trying to be really welcoming and let other people come in. But you could see there would be this popular clique. There would be the goth clique. There would be this, the, the anime clique. You would have all these different cliques of people separating themselves and anybody else like was not part of this group. It's like, that's, we don't do that. That's weird. We don't talk to other people. But the, the reality is, is what the Bible talks about is unity is an absolute non-negotiable essential piece to the body of Christ, to the church. This is what we are supposed to be and what we are supposed to be marked by. And so using Jesus' own words, this own unity, this own love that we would have for one another is a marker to the rest of the world of the legitimacy of our faith of the legitimacy of the fact that we are Jesus' disciples, we are following him, is if we love one another and if we show unity with one another. And so this morning, we're going to look at one of, another one of P Apostle Paul's metaphors for the church. It's called the body of Christ. And all of this is about to point to the necessity of unity within the church and that there is to be a unity within diversity, the diversity within unity that God has placed upon us. And so what does this mean? How are we going to do this? And so this morning, we're going to look at four truths that distinguish the church as the body of Christ. And so I invite you to go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 31 this morning. And I want to give a quick background to 1 Corinthians because 1 Corinthians is kind of one, it's, it's a pretty deep and intense book and so we can understand where Paul is coming from when he talks in this particular passage. 
The Corinthian church was a church that Paul had formed and they eventually started having some real problems, started having some problems with division and differences of opinions. And even some, when we look at this passage, there were people that were believing that they were more superior than others because of certain gifts that they had and certain abilities that they had with miraculous things like speaking in tongues, like speaking in another language you don't know or healing people or things along those lines. And so Paul is writing this letter to dispel any of those problems and any of those issues, trying to bring them back to have unity with one another because division is what destroys a church. And everything, Paul basics, Paul's basic answer is that everything is seen through the lens of the gospel. And I talked about this a couple weeks ago when I preached last that our life is not, like the gospel is not just this one-time commitment that we hear and we say, okay, yes, I commit my life to Christ because he died for me, forgave me of my sins, and now I'm going to live a new life. We don't do that just one time. It's an every day. We wake up in the morning and put on the new life in Christ and say, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to be. God, would you enable me through your spirit to do it? So everything, every question that Paul answers goes through that lens. And all of this, this section is continuing to talk about the idea of spiritual gifts, how a church works together, how a church is united as a body. And all of it, all of this is for the building up of the church. So let's go ahead and look at verses 12 through 14 to start this morning. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many And so Paul has just gone through this little section where he's talking about these varying gifts that people have been given and they they need to express these gifts fully. So then he said, so he's going to use this analogy, this body analogy in order to convey his point. And so he says, just as a body, though it has many parts, it is one. So we look at the human body. It is truly from the outside. It is one. It is whole. It is complete, connected. But we know from our studies in in science through schooling, that there are many parts, many different working parts within the human body that are working together uh, to help the body function. And this is the point that Paul is making. It says, this is, it's the same thing with Christ. And the, the assumed phrase here is not just, just with Jesus, but with Christ's body. It is the same way with Christ's body. It's the same way with the church. There are a lot of different types of people. There's a diverse group of people that represent each of these parts and now have a role to play within the church. And so this is actually our first truth that we're going to look at this morning is we are united as one body through the spirit with many parts. So the body, the point of it is we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body. And then he says, and we were all given those one spirit to drink. It's all about the Holy Spirit coming into our lives when we commit our lives to Christ, that conversion moment. And we are then given this new life to live. And so that is what unites us. That is what bonds us together into the body. And so we are grafted in. When we give our lives to Christ, we are grafted into that body. And then he makes a very important point to say whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. He's saying that to break apart any sort of idea that someone could say, well, it's only this type of person. It is only for Jews or Gentiles. So it's only, or Jew. So it's only for the certain ethnic group. Or no, it's only for Gentiles. Or no, it's, uh, it's only for free people. It's not for slaves. It, he's breaking all of that apart. He says it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, your background, even your age, anything like that, it doesn't matter. You, if you give your life to Christ, you are a part of the body. All of us are a part of it. If you've put your faith in Christ, and so that, that means that no one person, no one type of person gets preferential treatment within the body. And this also means that There is not a race that is prominent over any other. There is not an age demographic that takes more precedence. It is all about all of us coming together as varying parts, as differing people coming together to serve the church and to serve God. And so there's a couple points I want to make sure to clarify here because what what we can do with this whole idea of diversity within unity is we can get in some really weird uh, angle, take some really weird angles on this. And it starts with, and so this is what it means. 
You, diversity and unity basically means that we celebrate the successes of those of us who would profess to be Christians. And so those of us who are and believe what the same things that we believe. So things, there's another church across town that's doing great things. We say, praise God. They're doing amazing things. Thank the Lord that the gospel is being preached and they are, and people are being saved. And then that means we should also be celebrating diversity within our church of different ethnic backgrounds of age differences and celebrating that and, and working together in order to reach the people around us. And so we should be seeking this. We should be seeking diversity amongst our body. But what it doesn't mean, because this is what people can sometimes do with it, it doesn't mean that we can have differences in opinions on like non-negotiable, essential matters of what the Bible says on doctrinal, theological mat matters. So that's particularly like when it comes to what we believe about the cross, what we believe about Jesus, what we believe about his word. Some of these things, these things are non-negotiable essentials that we believe those and we have the same agreement because the reality is this is the faith that God has given to us, that Jesus has given to us through his word and we need to have these. But there are some things that are, not, that are non-essential, and so they're on the negotiable end. I've heard it put this way. There are things that we hold with a closed fist in terms of our belief that we are going to hold on to it. We are not going to let go. This is something we have to have and have to believe, and there are some things we can hold with an open hand. And that could be with things like church government or the way that we do baptism, things of that nature. And so we have this varying different roles, these different people doing different things. Um, but what about the priority of these gifts? What about how they work out in the midst of the body? Well, let's go ahead and continue and look at verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So again, Paul is going to continue to elaborate upon this idea, and he is also, again, dispelling some of these ideas that the Corinthians were believing. And one of them was that there were gifts that took priority, that were better than others, and so they would look at each other, and, and some, some of these people would say, well, because I, am not, I don't have this particular gift, then I don't, I don't belong as part of the body. I am not here. I'm, and so you look at it, he, he says, now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It doesn't stop being part of the body. How you become part of the body is simply by believing in Christ. And so there is something that you have been given to do. And so Paul, Paul says it in two different ways. And he asks these rhetorical question, this rhetorical question, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? It's, it's this really strange picture. And I wanted to try and find a picture like on the internet that didn't totally terrify us of what, a body just being an eye. Like, that, that would be the weirdest thing you could possibly think of. It, and what Paul is doing, he's, he's kind of, he's, he's being absurd on purpose. He's putting out this absurdity to, to pull it up in our minds that we go, well, yeah, that does sound really ridiculous. If we're focused on one particular gift or one type of person, it would become a total deformity, not the church like it's supposed to be. And that's Paul's point. The whole point of diversity within the unity is the fact that there are differing parts and they all contribute in different ways so that we don't become a total monster and a deformed beast as a church. The point for us to, be, to understand here is that, and this is the truth, our second truth we'll look at, is that each part has been placed by God to play a specific role. I want you just to look at verse 18. Look down in your Bibles. He says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, look at that phrase, just as he wanted them to be. God is the one who placed the parts in the body just where he wanted them to be. And so there are gifts and abilities that you have been given that I have been not. And it was God's purpose and God's plan for you to have that gift. And why are these gifts given? Why were they given to us? I'm going to show you another verse. It'll be on the screen, and you don't need to turn there. It's Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. 
So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach, there is that word, unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And so Paul, this is Paul again, and he says Christ himself gave the apostles. And so he, these, these particular people, these are the ones who are, he's saying, these are the gifts that are saying, these are the leadership gifts. This is their role to play. This is their job. And their job is to then equip the rest of the people for works of service. So our job as leadership is to equip you to be able to use the gifts that God has given you to serve. And the whole purpose of that, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. And, and look at this. So the body of Christ is built up and then we're built up into the knowledge of the Son of God that we would know Jesus, that we would know him more and that we would become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So the whole purpose of all of our gifts that we have been given is to build up its church by building up people's knowledge, by re- helping them reach maturity in knowing Christ and becoming more a more mature follower of Christ and then to reach the fullness, the, to reach to the end, to make it to the end. And so the whole point of all of this is not for you. You have not been given a gift just for you so you can enjoy it and get some sort of pleasure out of it, which truly it does still happen. You still get pleasure out of it, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is so that you can build up the church. And each one of us have been given this role to play. And, and it's okay for us to say, I have this gift, but I don't have this gift. So let me give you an example. You don't want me doing maintenance work around this church. Uh, we would be in serious trouble if you wanted me to fix something around here. Like, I, you know, the other day, something, one of the sprinklers or put was, had a hole in it. And so immediately, what, what did I do? Called Sam Rich. <laughs> you take care of this because I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, you don't want me doing that. You, don't, you also don't want me coming up with like policy and structure of like organizing people that just, I, I'm not good at that. That is not what I'm good at. I'm, this is what I feel most comfortable doing is standing up here and telling you what the Bible says. I feel way more comfortable doing that, much more, uh, much more gifted. And lastly, you don't want me doing art projects like uh, you know, if you, if you were to ask me, hey, do you want to do a mural in the children's wing? I was like, no, I don't want to scare children away. This is not going to be good. I'm terrible at stick figures, okay? This is not something that you want me to do. But that's the point, is that each one of us has this different role to play and that we all work together in unison as one body, united together so that we can build up the church. And Paul exaggerates this point on purpose just to make us realize We all need each other. We all need to recognize the value of one another and the gifts that we have been given. But within this, there is a very small implication about something, and and it has to do, and this could get uncomfortable, is is with church attendance, okay? Because here's the thing of what happens. People start to believe in their mindset that, okay, you know, I've got got all kinds of, all, all these other things going on. You know, church just is, it just, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. I need my rest. I get that. Trust me, I completely get that. But the standard shouldn't be some, some sort of like number or like percentage of, okay, well, I went to church 80% of Sundays this, this year. You know, I think, I think I'm doing pretty good. That's not the point. The point for you to come to church is not just to fulfill a quota of you coming to church, but to be faithful in what God has given you and the gifts that he has given you to serve and utilize your gifts so that the church may be built up. So it's all about faithfulness, not just this number. It's about faithfulness. And so it's you saying, God, I want to be faithful to what you have called me to do, how you have gifted me. So God, I'm going to show up and I'm going to step up and I'm going to serve. I'm going to do something. I'm going to get involved. I want to help out because I, I see that you have gifted me in this particular way and I need to use that. And that's, uh, that's, that's more the standard. I don't want to be the one that stands up here and, and you know, Want and pulls up a conversation of, oh, well, you've only gone to church 20 times this year. Let's have a little conversation. That's not what I want to do here. Because the point, again, it's faithfulness. It's saying, God, I am, my time is yours, and so I want to serve you with the gifts that you have given me. And I want us to think of this point. Jesus even says this in Matthew 20, 28. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if Jesus, the Lord of the earth, the one who created all things, even if, even if, him, if even he said that he came to serve, not to be served, 
How much more so is that our job to come and serve? Because we are not him. We are not his, we are, we are not, we are not God. And so it is really important for us to understand that this is something that we need to do to be, to help this church grow. We, if you want to see this church grow, if you want to see this church be able to do what it needs to do, Come, step up, be faithful, find out the gifts that you have. We are glad to help you with that. That's what we're here to do. We are glad to help you figure that out and we will put you in places. And I said this a couple weeks ago, sometimes you're gonna walk away and say, nope, not for me. And that's okay. That is completely fine. Okay, we're gonna continue. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our, parts, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And so then Paul starts to, again, dispel this other idea that the Corinthians had, that basically if they were... One, they had this one particular gift, this, these miraculous gifts. They can't look at somebody else's gifts and say, I don't need you. I mean, you can, you can feel the weight of how like, awful that would be to say to someone, we don't need you. We don't need your gifts. That is a horrible thing to say. And Paul is pointing out that these are really important. Each person has a gift and has a role to play, and they are essential. And that's what these next verses, this 23 through 24, is what he's kind of talking, or 22 through 24, he's talking about these different parts of the body that we might think, okay, well, that's not that important. That that's really isn't an, uh, an essential part of the body. We can be okay with it. Let's just let it be. We don't need it. That's not the point. Basically, he's saying he's, he's turning, it's this reversal of ideas that we could say that, that basically every gift that has been given by God plays an equal and important role. So that's our third truth that we're looking at this morning is that there is no role or gift that is more important than others and each part needs the other. Each part necessarily needs the other in order for the body to function. So we think of the human body like this. That is how we function. And so when we think of this whole idea if one part suffers, the rest of it suffers with it. Like if you're if you get a severe injury, the rest of your body suffers along with you and you feel it. Uh, I, have, I have chronic headaches. I get headaches all the time. Um, probably tension headaches just because I'm, I get too stressed out about things. And so when I get those headaches, you just, I, just, I just feel it. And just the rest of my body suffers with it. And it is really frustrating to try and deal with. And this is the whole thing is when we have a body, a body part that is not working and is not doing what it needs to do, is, it is hard for us. It makes, it makes us suffer. And so when we look at these parts, we can't just say, okay, well, that, you know, that little thing that somebody does that they're really good at, well, that's, that's not that important. The whole, this whole section here hinges on what Paul says, verses 24 and 25. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Look, here it is. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. So each one of these parts should have equal concern and, each equal, uh, and giving equal value and honor to all the other parts because God has put them there. It is God who has placed them there. There's no part that takes more value or importance than another. So I do, like, my role up here talking is, like, it is only, it's dependent upon other people doing a myriad of things before this so that we can even have this building and even have this opportunity for us to have service. And so I can't stand up here and say, well, my gift that God has given me is way more important. Like we don't need that other person because of what they can do. No, I need them because we wouldn't be able to have a service here or we wouldn't be able to have a youth group. This is the point. We all need each other. We can't look at one particular gift and say, well, that's not that important. Because remember, Corinthians were saying things like these miraculous gifts, this speaking in tongues, healings, things like this. These take are, are more, way more important than any of these other gifts. So none of them are more important. None of them are, are, but are all equal in value. And let's make sure we understand something here. 
The backbone of the church is in the people who are willing to do the work that nobody sees, the behind the scenes kinds of gifts. So if you're a behind the scenes type of person, let me just say right now, thank you. Thank you so much for stepping up and doing those thankless jobs that people don't want to do or else it would be nearly impossible for us to have a church here. So we are all interwoven, we are all interconnected, but this all means that we need to have humility to recognize that our gifts have been given to us by God and that nobody's gift takes more precedence over the other. Okay, let's continue. Verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Paul's point here is that none in the church, nobody can claim to be the whole body and not one of us can possibly be excluded from contributing to the body. We have this whole idea that we see this and we say, you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And so Paul is reiterating his point. But he is also making sure to say, God has placed certain people in these leadership positions, these apostles, these prophets, these teachers. These are the ones that are of equal value along with the miracles, the teaching, the or the miracles, the healings, and those kinds of things. Because miracles and gifts of healing and things like that and speaking in tongues are for individual type people. It encourages like one person at a time. The whole idea of like teaching and preaching, it affects the whole body all at once if we are all here. So we are all able to be encouraged by it. And this is why these take a, um, a leadership type role. Again, not more important in value, just taking precedence in leadership. And so again, this whole thing that Paul is going on, he goes into these, he goes into these rhetorical questions. Are all apostles, are all prophets, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And we all know what the answer is. No, not everyone is that. But then he says a very interesting thing. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. What are these greater gifts? What are they? Well, when we look at the rest of the passage, the rest of what Paul has to say in chapters 13 through 14, and I promise I'm not going through that this morning. That would, we'd be here until four o'clock and I don't want to do that. But what he goes into is this whole idea of seeking love. That the whole point is that we seek the love of the body of Christ rather of our brothers and sisters in Christ rather than promoting ourselves and our gifts. And again, this goes back to where we started that we love one another as Jesus has loved us first, as Jesus has given up of his life for us, dying on the cross for our sins, raising himself up to new life, all of that. As Christ has loved us, so we are to love one another. We are to love one another with a self-sacrificing kind of love, each one of us for the other, giving, um, giving preferential treatment to other people by saying to, to them, uh, you are more important than me, you're your gifts, I want to celebrate you. I want to give you praise. I want to give you um, encouragement for what you have done and enable you to be able to do what, you, uh, what God has given you to do. And so the whole thing is based upon love. And I want to close to give you a little bit of a visual to think of it like this. I want you to think of an orchestra. If you've ever been to a symphony or if you've ever been to uh, a musical uh, and you saw the orchestra, and you know, you could think about it. Orchestras could have some extremely talented people, so there's going to be some very strong personalities. There's going to be some disagreements. There's going to be some conflicts and divisions and things like that within those kind of, those kind of units. And it can happen, and sometimes it can happen the other way, where they're bonded and they're doing great. But when we think about it, all of these varying personalities, all of these differences and, and these different instruments, these different types of people playing different things, and they all can come together and play a beautiful piece of music. And how? Because their eyes are set on the conductor. The conductor is the one that's leading them. The conductor is telling them what they need to be doing. And yes, they're following that sheet of music. And that sheet of music, well, you can look at that, it's just as your Bible, 
You are look, we, so the whole point of what we are doing, we are to look to our conductor, to our, to our leader, Jesus, and to say to him, you lead us, you tell us what to do. You are the head of this body and we are here to serve you and to do what you tell us to do, to use the gifts that you have given us so that we can build up this church in unity, in love, so that we can show the rest of the world that we are who we say we are. We are Christians, we are followers of Christ. And so let's let that be our mindset. That no matter what our differences and maybe these minor disagreements could be, that we would seek to look to our conductor and let him use us to build his kingdom here on earth. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. And God, I'm so thankful that you give us these gifts, God, that you have specifically given to us for a specific purpose to build up the church. God, they're not for us to to uh, consume and to use for our own, but God, to be used to build up the entire church. God, to, to help people grow in Christ, to help people know who you are. And so God, we are so thankful for that opportunity, that gifting that you have given us. God, it is a grace that we don't deserve because of our sin, but God, you still give it anyway because you are a God of love and of grace and of mercy and compassion. And so God, we, we thank you for this morning and we pray this all in your name, amen.